you are my shelter. You're my peace in a time of storm. Well, praise God. Thank uh, Stephen Hurd and our praise and worship team and our band for leading us in worship. Our God is a great God. And in fact, he is worthy to be praised and worthy to be exalted. And uh, I want to thank them for leading us into to the throne of Almighty God. I'm grateful for your uh, presence tonight, wherever you are and whoever you are that's joining us tonight. Uh, it is our prayer that uh, God would bless you tonight and that you would receive a word that would be uh, that would minister to you tonight. I've, I've been trying to uh, not talk about what I'm going to talk about tonight, but uh, the Lord continues to just bring it in front of me consistently. So I know this word is for somebody today about some going on in your life. So I just want you to take copious notes. I'm going to try to walk through this uh, slowly. I've got a lot of scriptures to read, and I uh, just want you to take it to heart. Okay? Thank you for joining us both local and around the country and around the world. I'm eternally grateful and thankful for all of you. Let's pause and take a moment and, and let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, it is with a heart full of thanksgiving that we come before you to give you praise and thanks for your loving kindness to us, your tender mercies. Thank you for just loving us and caring for us. Thank you for being our our, uh, our great God that we can depend on and trust in. And I uh, give you the praise and the thanks. And we pray today that you would uh, be in charge of this teaching tonight, that you would use it to impact lives. I'm praying tonight, Father, that you would speak to some heart that you've, you've designed for this word, this message, that it would, uh, it would uh, affect, impact, and change somebody's life. I pray today that you forgive us of our sins. We acknowledge our transgressions. I ask you to meet the needs of your sons and daughters. And I pray today, Father, that you would just put a shield around this word. Don't let the enemy take it out of anybody's heart, but that it would find a resting place that it can be applied in lives and that when it's all said and done, your name will get the glory. I, say, I pray for unsaved people that might be joining us uh, during this teaching. I pray for those who are backslidden, those who have... Uh, fallen by the wayside, those who've been disrupted in their journey. Uh, pray to God that you would let this message impact them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Alrighty, God bless you again for joining us tonight. I want to start tonight before I get into the meat of it by setting up the teaching tonight with a story. Some of you have heard me talk about this story before, but I want to give you the biblical, the places in the Bible. I want to show it to you. I want you to see it. I want you to take these notes so you can uh, comprehend what's going on. It is a story uh, that I believe has significant impact to all, all of us at some point in our life. It's going to, you're going to remember this story. It's going to have uh, an impact upon your life. 2 Samuel chapter 16 is where this story begins. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 23. And it talks about a man named Ahip, Ahip, Ahithophel. You know, that's, 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 I might just have to call him A from now on. Ahithophel, verse 23 of 2 Samuel 16. It says, now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracles of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. The thing that I want you to see here is here's a man whose relationship with God was so on target and so powerful and so anointing, anointed, that Ahithophel, when people talked to him, they felt like they were actually hearing from God. I don't know where you are, but that's what I want to be. I want to be a person that when people ask me advice or counsel, that they feel like they've heard from God, that they, they've got the wisdom of God and the heart of God. And the scripture says here in 2 Samuel 16 that uh, he was an advisor to King David. He was in King David's cabinet. He was one of King David's uh, advisors, one of his counselors, and his advice was considered as though when David talked to him as though he was talking to God. That is 2 Samuel 16 verse 23. But one chapter later in chapter 17, one chapter later, chapter 17 verse 23, it says this, now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled the donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. What a tragic, horrifying, unbelievable situation. Here's a man who, who, who knew how to hear from God, who had the mind and the heart of God. But something happened in the course of his life that led him to, to end his life. I think it's very troubling that so many people in our day and time are committing suicide. And the question might be, what might be some of the things that lead them to this? It's a number of things, but I want to talk about one of the things that led this man, this man Ahithophel, to such a horrifying decision. I want you to follow this story with me. I'm going to read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 11, and I'm going to read 27 verses. So just bear with me for a moment as I read these 27 verses, uh, because in fact, uh, it's going to tell us, we're going to learn something. If we follow this story, and if you follow me with this story, it's going to tell us what led this wise man to a place of ending his life. 2 Samuel 11, beginning at verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, Ammon and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. Get the picture. There's a battle. There's, he sent the army out to battle, but instead of going with them to battle, David stayed at home in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, this is important, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? We're going to come back to that verse in a little bit, but just keep in mind, David saw this beautiful woman walking, who was bathing while he was on the roof of his house, and he inquired about the woman and wanted to know who she was, and they told him who she was. 
She was the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. By the way, Uriah and Eliam were both men. They were considered a part of David's uh, mighty men. He had 37 mighty men. That We'll talk about that later. I'm running ahead of myself. But these men were considered the best of the best, the cream of the crop. And Bathsheba, the daughter of one of these men, and Uriah the Hittite, who was married to this woman Bathsheba. Verse number four says, Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah the, to David. So Uriah was in a, a part of the army. He was off at war. And when he discovered that Uriah's wife was pregnant and he was the father, he sent word to bring Uriah home thinking that Uriah would come home and sleep with his wife, have sex with his wife, and then he was thinking that perhaps he would think that the baby was his. Verse number seven. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war, the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Look at this. Go down to your house. Go home. Wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. You see that? You, you see the picture here? This man is so loyal, so dedicated. He said, I, I can't go in and sleep with my wife and eat food and celebrate and have a party when our nation is at war and at battle. Verse 12, then David said to Uriah, wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So now David's about to send him back to the war. David writes a letter. He saw this man. He's gotten him drunk. He's done everything he could to get him to go home and sleep with his wife, but he doesn't do it. So David writes a letter and puts it in the hand of Uriah and tells him to go back to the war and give the letter in his hand that he's given to him to his his captain, his general, his leader on the battlefield. And he wrote in the letter saying, verse 15, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. He gives the man instructions in the letter, put Uriah in the heat of the battle, retreat from him, leave him, and a few of the others unprotected, alone, by themselves. Verse 18, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? 
Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerub Jerubashesh? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a milestone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. The man that you told us to put in the heat of the battle and pull back, King David, he's dead too. Verse 22, so, so the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. Verse 23, and the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to, the, to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the, shot from the wall at your servants and some of the king's servants are, are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him, so encourage him. So now that the man is dead that he wants dead, now he tells him, Go ahead, go forth and try to win the battle. But he's happened internally. It's a, it's a secret. He hasn't told anybody. It, it, it's, it's something that he has plotted in his heart to do. David has done it. And so he says to him to tell Joab to go ahead and fight the battle, try to win. Verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. I do want to make something a little clear here. Bathsheba was, didn't have a choice. The king, the king who, if you didn't do the right thing by the king, he could kill you. And so he basically raped her. He forced, he, he, he is the king. And so her husband is dead now. She's with child and she mourns. Verse 27 says, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But here's the king, the key thing. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I think it's important for us to know that we can do a lot of things, but you can't hide stuff from God. Very few people if anybody knew what David had done. A few people knew, but not very many. But more important thing, the Lord knew what David had done. The Lord was aware. And the Bible gives us this commentary that this thing that David done displeased God. This is a significant issue. It is a challenging moment. Uh, now, having said that, hold on to that story. Because I want to jump, I want to jump to chapter 15 and look at verse number 12. David has now married the woman, and now there's some things going on in David's kingdom and in David's life. And in verse number 12 of 2 Samuel 15, Absalom, let me give you some background information. Absalom, his son, is now seeking to overtake David's kingdom. He is plotting. He is plotting to scheme to overtake his father's kingdom. In verse 12 of 2 Samuel 15, it says this, Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, from his city, from Gilad, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy grew strong for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. Get the picture now. Here's David's the king, and now he's got, and he's gathered a number of men to overtake his kingdom, and he does an unbelievable thing. He, he asks for one of David's counselors to leave David, Ahithophel, the same man we just talked about, who was like he was, when people talked to him, it was as if he was the counselor of God, the oracle of God. He now beseeches and invites Ahithophel to come and join him in his campaign to overthrow David. That's an amazing thing that this man has done. As a matter of fact, in chapter 15, verse 31, a matter of fact, in, matter of fact, in Ahithophel came. And we're going to talk for a reason as to why did, why did Ahithophel leave the king's camp to go and join? Why did he do that to go and join uh, Absalom. 
In verse 31 of 2 Samuel 15, it says, Then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. They told David that your, your main counselor, your main advisor, has left your cabinet and has gone and joined the camp of your son who is seeking to overthrow you. And David said, verse 31, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Wow, man. The, David recognized how wise and what an amazing advisor Ahithophel was. And so he prayed to God to turn his advice into foolishness. And the question is, here's the question. Number one, why would Ahithophel, who was in David's cabinet, leave his cabinet and join his son, his wicked son, by the way, Absalom, who was trying to overtake his, his camp. Why would he do such a thing? And why would he, later on in his life, turn to a place where he committed suicide? Here's the answer. Here's the result of that thing. Look at chapter 23, verse 34. It gives us some insight. Matter of fact, in chapter 23, it lists these 37 mighty men. I know this sounds crazy. Just stick with me, y'all. Just hang with me for a few minutes. It's all going to come together in just a moment. Come on, hang with me. Y'all watch those soap operas and stuff, and y'all wait to the end for the plug of what the deal is. I'm almost at the end of this story. In, verse in chapter 23, verse 34, it gives us an insight. It gives us the names in chapter 23 of all these mighty men. And in the midst of these mighty men, it says, and I'm not going to try to do a hatchet job on these names that are here. But notice in the middle of verse 34, it says, Eliam, the son of, Ahith of Ahithophel. So Ahithophel, this wise counselor, had a son named Eliam. And verse, going back to 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see that the daughter of Eliam, is the wife of Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba. Get the picture. I, it, I probably, it probably slept, y'all. You might have missed it. You, probably, you might have missed it. But here's the deal. Here's the, here is the situation. That Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam, and Eliam is the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. I hope I haven't, haven't confused you. Ahithophel's granddaughter is Bathsheba. When Ahithophel realized what David had done by killing his granddaughter's husband, something got in his heart and he could not let it go. He got bitter. He got angry. He left David and joined Absalom because he wanted to overthrow David because of the wickedness that David did. He, he got he, he did not have the capacity or the ability to forgive David for what he did. Now, I want to talk about this for a few moments. This is, I, I hope I haven't confused you. I'm hoping you can walk with this story because what I want to talk to you tonight about is forgiveness. That's what the story is about tonight. The ability to forgive. Some of you, your life is being impacted and you can't move forward with God. Some of you have lost your connection with God because somebody did something wicked and horrible and you haven't been able to walk. You haven't been able to let it go. They've done something that you can't even imagine. Somebody in church hurt you. Somebody uh, close to you bruised you. Some, some boss damaged you. Something happened and it has affected your walk with God. It's affected your communion with the Father. It's affected your ability to move forward and go into another place. This man could not forgive. And some of you are in that same posture and place. I tried to let this thing go. I tried to walk away from it, but every day God keeps talking to me about this. For weeks I've been wanting to talk about it. For weeks it's been nagging at me. For weeks, and I, and I, I kept resisting because I've talked about it so many times over the past, but I, I couldn't let it go this time. Today I had to do it. And maybe it's because you're on this today. You've been walking away. You can't stand when somebody's name is mentioned. You can't, you can't take it. You haven't been able to forgive. Who is it that has hurt you? 
Who is it that has bruised you? What David did was wicked, y'all. Don't get me wrong. There's no excuse for what he did. It was more than wicked. He not only committed adultery with this man's wife, he had her husband killed. Oh, yes, it was wicked. It was horrible. I, I understand Ahithophel's posture. I know he was hurt and bruised and mad and angry. But you and I need to understand that when you don't forgive, when you hold on, when you get bitter, it affects you. Your health is affected by your ability to forgive. If you can't forgive, it's going to affect your life. Ultimately, they did wrong, but your ability or your lack of ability to forgive them will also affect you. It becomes critically important that you have an understanding that it is not worth you holding on to it. It's not worth you carrying it on. It's not worth you keep telling other people about it. It's not worth it. It affects you. Psalm 32 verse 3 says, When I kept silent, my, my bones grew old, though my groaning, through my groaning all the day long. I kept talking about it. I kept, every time you get a chance, every time you get an opportunity, you telling somebody about what they done done and how they treated you and how they wronged you. When their name comes up, that feeling comes back up inside of you. And some of you, even though you may not say nothing to nobody, when you kept silent, when you kept it held up inside of you, you still, you still didn't let it go. Your bones grow old, the scripture says. Here's Proverbs 17, 22. It says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. It affects your health. Bitterness will dry your bones. And I'm trying to help somebody get past this. I'm trying to help somebody get to a place of letting it go. Let it go. So if you want to know what the lesson is about tonight, it's the principles of forgiveness. That's what it's about. What are the keys to having the capacity and the ability to forgive? This is important. And maybe, let me tell you something, maybe even tonight, if you don't have anger or pain or something against somebody or unforgiveness, hold on to the teaching because I promise you something going to happen that you're going to need to forgive somebody. Something is going to happen. Somebody's going to bruise you. Somebody's going to hurt you. Somebody's going to damage you. Somebody's going to treat you the wrong way. See, that term forgiveness means to lay it aside. Let it alone. Send it away. That's what it means. It means, it ce it means to cease to feel resentment. That's what it means. It means you clear the record. You wipe the slate clean. It, mean, it means you remember without pain. Let me go through those again. That's critical. You got to understand that. You got to lay it aside. Let it alone. Send it away. Cease to feel resentment. Clear the record. Remember it, but remember it without the pain. If you keep bringing it up, if you keep on re rehearsing it in your mind, can't let it go, it's going to impact you and hurt you. And I think it's a good, important thing for you to understand and recognize that even though somebody else hurts you, it's not worth you, or, hurt, or even hurt somebody else, uh, hurt somebody else. It's not worth you carrying the pain of that. It's not worth you harboring it and let it impact you. I could think I, over my life of so many times somebody has done something many times. And here's what I believe. I believe you keep having situations happen to you until you learn how to let it go and go to the next level. You, you, at some point in your Christian walk, you have to learn how to let it go. It's one of the lessons of a Christian that you've got to learn how to forgive. Here are the principles. Let me go ahead through them. I'm, I'm taking time like I got all day. But I'm so passionate about this. I'm passionate because God kept talking to me about it week after week after week. Every week I've been coming here for the past however many weeks. I kept wanting to talk about it, but I kept talking myself out of it. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me let it go no more. And I'm trying to help you today. I don't know who you are, but you have held me up. Got me jacked up feeling this thing. Now I'm, I got to get it off of me, and it's for you. God wants you to let it go. Here's point number one. I just got five or six principles for you. Here's number one. Recognize, realize that we all need forgiveness. Everybody has done something for which you need forgiveness. Everybody. 
Don't you act like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Ain't never hurt nobody. Ain't never bruised. Ain't never made a mistake or an error. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the point, missed the mark. Sometimes people get, uh, I know God must, I wonder what God be thinking sometimes when he looks at the saints and, and you do something uh, or been doing something and yet somebody does something and you can't forgive them. And I think, I think God must be saying now, look at here. Look at this joker right here who got the nerve not to forgive somebody. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 21 through 35. It's a lot of verses, but hang with me. Matthew chapter 28. Uh, Matthew 18, I'm sorry, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? I think this is funny. Peter goes up to Jesus and said, how many times I got to forgive that joker? Can I, let, can I pay him back after seven times? After he done done it the seventh time, can I let it go? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seven times, 70 times 70, seven, 70 times seven. So I'm not a mathematician, but I think that's 490 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Wow, that's, that's profound to me. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Woo! Wow. Profound. This man got forgiven, but he couldn't forgive somebody else. And aren't a lot of saints like that? God forgives you, but you can't forgive somebody else. God wiped your slate clean. God gave you another chance. God erased the debt that you had. God forgot about your sins. And yet you keep on harboring what somebody else has done. Verse number 35 says this. So my heavenly father will also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. God will not forgive you if you have the inability to forgive others. Who that's y'all. Mm. Wow. Isn't that profound, y'all? Isn't that, that's, that's powerful. You got to get that. You have to forgive. You got to figure out how to do it. You got to figure out how to move, move forward and pass it. And that's why I'm having this teaching, to teach you what are the principles that you need to have and what you need to do. So number one, recognize you guilty. You done done wrong. You ain't perfect. You ain't dotted every I. You ain't ever crossed every T. You ain't been holy all your life. Here's principle number two. God has greater purpose in allowing the offense. This is an important thing too. Um, uh, when God allows something to happen to you, there's a reason by why, by why he allows it to happen. There's a purpose behind it. It becomes important for you to understand there's something greater behind it. I, 
All of us got to learn what's the reason God allowed me to go through this drama, this pain. Why did God let this person hurt me? What lessons does God want me to learn? Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. There's a, there's a greater reason why God allows it to happen. You got to get that. You got to understand that. I am persuaded that God never allows me to be put in a situation that is greater than what I have the capacity to handle. But if he allows it to come into my domain and come into my life, there's something he wants me to learn. There's something that's going to come out of it. All things work together. It don't say some things. The scripture says, and we know that all things work together. All. All means everything. Everything. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let's look at Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. Let's read this. This is profound. Walk with me through this story for just a moment. Now, y'all remember the story about Joseph. This is about Joseph, who had been sold into slavery by his brothers and went through a series of events in the course of his life until he became the number two man in all of Egypt. But it started off with his brothers who hated him, selling him into slavery. Verse 45, beginning of verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. I should have told you, I forgot, that he went through a series. He's the number two man. There's a, there's a famine in the land, and his brothers are looking for food, and they end up in Egypt, and somehow they end up in the court in front of their brother who they sold into slavery. And right here in verse number one, it says, David couldn't keep it to himself. Uh, I'm sorry, Joseph couldn't keep it to himself anymore. Uh, he told everybody else to leave, uh, and he started to cry. And then in verse number three, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. I guess they were. They thought he was dead. They sold him to slavery. And here they are many years later. And David discloses who he is. He asked about his father. But they couldn't say anything. Verse four. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into, sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Listen to this. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, verse 8, highlight verse 8, circle verse 8. This is it. Everything boils down to verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Woo! But God, and he has made me a father to, to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler therefore all, over all of and, slow down. And a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I love this. Joseph, Joseph says to them, you sold me into slavery. Don't get mad. God had it all in control. Yes, I went to prison. And yes, I got accused of trying to rape a woman. And yes, I was in prison. And yes, I went through a series of things in life. But I ended up in a place that God had planned for me all the time. God had this in his plan all the time, so I'm not mad at you. I haven't, I don't harbor anything. I couldn't be here had you not have sold me into slavery. I, I could not be the number two man had I not interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams. And I wouldn't have been able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. I wish y'all knew the Bible. I wouldn't have to tell you the story. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream had I not been in prison. And had I not been in prison, I wouldn't have interpreted the baker's dream, who actually told the Pharaoh that I interpreted his dream. And if I hadn't have been in, in, uh, 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 and the reason I was in jail is because uh, 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 the, the general's wife, pa, pa, the general's wife uh, 
accused me of trying to have sleep with her when I didn't do that. And if I hadn't have been a slave, I wouldn't have even been there. And if I if y'all hadn't have sold me into slavery, I wouldn't have even have been in part of his house. But anyway, these series of events that have gone in my life is what God orchestrated to get me where I am today. Some of y'all are not recognizing that the people who lied and hurt and tried to defeat you, whatever the reason was and whatever happened, y'all excuse me for preaching here, but I feel passionate about this now. Whatever it is that you had to go through, it's taking you somewhere. And you might not be there now, but you are headed that way. And God wants to teach you that instead of crying and moping and having that unforgiveness in your heart, tell yourself and remind yourself, God's got me in control and all things work together. And I can't wait to see where God is taking me. Preach on, Pastor Jenkins. I'm sorry, I'm... Let me, let me calm down for just a moment. I'm getting kind of excited here when I think about the power of God's control over our lives. He's over. And you getting bitter and mad and upset and angry. Don't be. Because I'm persuaded that nobody can stop you from being what God has destined for you to become and do. Nobody can. You think they're hurting you. They can't hurt you. You're under the hand and under the arms. and under, You're walking hand in hand with the king of kings. He's the king over kings and the Lord of lords. Whew. Excuse me for a second. Y'all, I've been harboring this thing in my heart for weeks. I'm sorry. I'm trying to help somebody here get it straight, get right with God. So, so, so God has a greater purpose in whatever they did. And you got to see at a, at, a, at a higher level. Stop looking down from the ground level. Look at it from 30,000 feet that God is moving the pieces on the table. God is orchestrating it all. Hallelujah. I get excited when I know about what God can do. Matter of fact, some of y'all need to go back to some of the people that you've harbored angry, anger and frustration against and cussed them out and gave them a piece of your mind. You need to go back and ask them to forgive you for responding the way you did and say, you know what, let me thank you. <laughs> Because God used you to help get me where I'm going. And I'm telling y'all, don't wait till you get to the final destination. Go ahead and give the thanks to God and to them now. I got to hurry up. I'm acting like I got all day here. Here's number three. God is responsible for vengeance. It's not your responsibility to pay nobody back. Don't you pay anybody back. Don't you get in the process of trying to pay anyone back. God is the one who makes payment back. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, listen to this, verse 19. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Don't you try to pay nobody back. That's God's job. If you try to pay somebody back, you're putting yourself in God's spot. I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Therefore, verse 20 says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Listen, it, you know, it says, if your enemy is, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And when you do that, you're heaping coals of fire on his head. Notice it didn't say, if you feel like it. <laughs> Notice it didn't say, if you feel led. Notice it didn't say, pray about doing it. Oh, y'all done got me going here tonight. I might, I'm probably going to go past 8 o'clock. Y'all just hang with me. I got to get, get this out of me. I don't know who this is for, but it's for somebody. You done held up the whole church and the whole community and everybody, all of our online family. You done held them up because God's trying to get you through this thing. Talking about, I don't feel led. No, you don't have to pray about it. You don't have to seek God. He tells us in the word what you need to do. Verse number 21 says, do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's God's plan. You don't have to ask God about it. Find somebody that hurt you, wronged you. Find something the good to do for them, to do to them, to do for them. That's what you got to do. 
Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't let the evil they've done overcome you, but overcome evil by doing good. Here's number four. I got to hurry up. The real offense, this is another important thing, is against God and not you. When somebody does something wrong, they really have sinned against God. Now, if you want to put yourself in and make yourself God, that's a dangerous posture to be. You and I don't have a heaven nor hell to put anybody in. We didn't make anybody. We can't condemn nobody. We can't send them to hell or heaven. The real offense is against you. When David sinned, I, 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 for the longest time I couldn't understand this, this verse right here in Psalm 51. These four verses in Psalm 51. This is actually the psalm that was written as a result of David recognizing the sin that he did when he came to light with it. It says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He recognized that he had sinned and he had done wrong. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. And then he says this in verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That's a profound verse right there. Changed my life, my perspective. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This verse tells us that what we have to put in our scope is that the real sin is against God. We have to answer to God. You have to answer to God. The person who did the sin has to answer to God. And we are not God. Don't put yourself in the position as though they owe you anything. They need to get it right with God because when, when we reach eternity, whatever our sins are, we will individually have to answer to God. Not, we don't have to answer to anybody else. We have to answer to God. You have to keep that in mind, in your heart. When you're upset and bitter with somebody, you have to answer to God. Let me go to number five. Unforgiveness opens the door to satanic attack. When you get bitter in your heart, you're opening the door for the enemy to come in. That's what happened to Ahithophel. His inability to forgive David for what he done. David repented. He wept and cried. And that 51st Psalm is his psalm he wrote, the result of his behavior to God, uh, his sin against God, but what he did. But Hithophel did not have the ability or the capacity to forgive what he did to his granddaughter's husband. And it opened up his heart for the enemy to come in and turn his heart around. And that's what happens to you and I. If we are unable to forgive somebody for what they've done, it's going to put you in a position to let the enemy come in and torment you. I'm going to show you a torment verse in just a moment. But that's what the enemy will do. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Stick that sticker, underline that in your Bibles, because if you don't forgive, Satan will take advantage of us. He will take advantage of you if you don't forgive. He will take advantage of you. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, this is John 20, verse 23, they are retained. So here's the thing. If, if, if somebody comes to you and asks for forgiveness and you don't forgive them, the challenge with the sin is transferred from them to you. You're retaining it. You retain it. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But if you don't, if you retain the sin, the sins, you retain them. The person that's unable to forgive, they're retained, they're transferred. The burden of it, the challenge of it, is gone from them to you because you've refused to forgive them. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 and verses 14 and 15. And forgive us our debts, the Lord's Prayer, as we forgive our debtors. 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's an important deal. It's important that you and I learn to forgive. Matthew chapter 18, verses 13. Matthew 18, verses 34 and 35. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. I read this passage earlier about the man who wouldn't forgive others. And it says right here, his master was angry and here's what he did, delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due. See, the, see, when you don't forgive, you get turned over to torturers. The enemy has a freeway of access of torturing you. And I'm telling you today, unforgiveness, if somebody hurts you wrong, you ain't, they ain't, what they did is not worth you being tortured. It's not worth it. And the Lord wants us to forgive and wipe the slate clean. Verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This is, a, this is the scriptures. Our heavenly father will do the same to you. If from your heart, you're not just going through the motions, you're not just saying the words, but from your heart, if you don't forgive, you will be turned over to the torturers. God says you're not letting his presence in your heart flow. And he will turn you over and the devil will torture you. And that's why so many people don't have the ability to move forward and move on and make progress because they're not able to forgive. Wow. Wow. My God, I want to challenge you today. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to somebody, though. I feel a release. I feel, I feel free. I done got this thing off of me. It's on you now. Who am I talking to today? Who is this message for? Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to release? Who do, you, who do you need to go to and say, I've been harboring something against you, will you forgive me? Who am I talking to? I want to tell you it's worth getting it right. It's worth, it's worth getting right with God. Ahithophel lost his sense of direction, lost his sense of purpose, lost his joy in life, lost his ability to be the channel for the word of God. This man went from a place of high respect and in one chapter, one chapter later, he ends his own life. All because I believe he didn't have the capacity to forgive. We've all sinned and you gotta forgive. Let me, let, me, let me just tell you these points real quick once again. Recognize we all need forgiveness, number one. Number two, God has a greater purpose in allowing the offense. God, number three, is resp responsible for vengeance, not you. Number four, the real offense is against God and not you, you ain't God. Tell yourself, I ain't God, you ain't. Number five, unforgiveness opens the door to a satanic attack. You're going to let the enemy come in and torment you and torture you, and frustrate you and defeat you if you don't have the ability to forgive. Now, I'm going to take, take some questions in just a moment. But before we do that, I think we should pray. I want somebody here today who needs to move forward. I want you to, I want you to pray with me. You've been, you've been harboring that anger, somebody you haven't forgiven. Some of you have been in a position where you've tried to pay somebody back. Don't do it. And say, pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Please forgive me. I acknowledge I've been harboring this 
pain and this unforgiveness. Please forgive me, Lord. And I purpose to release that person and ask them to forgive me for my anger and my resentment. Because, Lord, I want to be right with you. I want your favor to flow in my life. I want your joy. I want your direction. I want your peace. And I want to pray tonight, right now, that you lead and guide me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Oh, I feel a release. I got it off of me. It's on you now. If you're watching this tonight and you need to get right with God, uh, follow the instructions on the screen. Make that move. If you're unsaved, get saved. Accept the Lord Jesus. He'll help you. Jesus will help you. Jesus will help you get you where you need to be. He'll help you. I'm going to go ahead and go to, I'm going to come back in just a moment. Let's, let me go ahead and uh, let y'all see these announcements. Stay with me. We'll come right back. This is FBCG News, your source for the latest news and information at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, where we're developing dynamic disciples. The Beyond Conference is going virtual. Beyond is an annual conference hosted by the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Pastors, leaders, ministers, and small business owners across the country connect to learn best practices from church and business leaders. This year's theme is sharpening the vision beyond 2020. Ministry as we know it has been disrupted, yet the mission remains the same. Our goal is to empower leaders like you to think strategically in hearing, captivating, and implementing your God-given vision in order to remain relevant and sustainable now and in the years to come. You'll learn tips and tools in the area of women and men's ministry, discipleship, music and arts, church operations, Christian education, communications, community engagement, and much more. There'll also be a special session especially designed for senior pastors. You don't want to miss it. This year's conference is Saturday, June 20th. For more information and to register, visit thebeyondconference.com. First Lady's 60th birthday is coming up, and we're giving her a virtual celebration. We are so blessed with an anointed woman of God who epitomizes holiness and faithful service to God. Tune in Friday, May 15th at 7 p.m. on the FBCG website and Facebook Live for a celebratory experience with special guests and stories on First Lady's Impact. You can still easily give your tithes and offerings online at fbcglenarden.org slash give or by mail at 3600 Brightseat Road, Landover, Maryland. Thanks to your giving, we are able to continue to spread the gospel across the world and assist those in need around the community. That's the news for this week. You can find more details about these and other events at fbcglenarden.org. Okay, all right, welcome back. Uh, take note of those announcements. Um, let me give you a couple of other announcements. We're going to um, have a grocery giveaway this coming Thursday from 9 until we run out at the Family Life Center on our worship uh, campus, worship center campus. So especially those, so many families are hurting and need food. So we're, we're going to be giving out grocery, bags of grocery this coming Thursday from 9 a.m. until noon or, or until we run out as long as the food lasts. Uh, so please make people aware of that, um, uh, especially in our church community. So that's this Thursday. Friday, hey, Friday is First Lady's birthday. I think it was in the announcement. Friday, 7 p.m. right here on this website and on our Facebook Live. We're going to be doing a virtual birthday celebration for First Lady Trina Jenkins for her 60th birthday. I wanted to do a grand occasion for her, but we're not able to. But you can help make it grand by joining us online. And we appreciate you all being there and being a part of that. Listen, next Tuesday, 
the next two Tuesdays, we're going to have some special guests because we're going to talk about uh, helping you uh, uh, take care of yourself, eat right, and uh, be healthy. So I have two special guests coming, uh, one next week and one the following week, on how to, you know, uh, how to take care of yourself, how to, <clears throat> how to not be an emotional eater. And, and how to eat the right things, and it's going to help you be better. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity tonight to practice what I've been preaching on forgiveness, and I'm going to ask you to forgive me because I'm not going to be able to answer any questions. It's 8 o'clock, and I'm trying to do better to end on time. So now you have an opportunity to forgive me because I said I was going to do questions, but I got so wound up, I just kept going and going and going, and I'm sorry. So maybe at a later time we'll take some questions, but I can't do it tonight. Hey, I love you all, and I pray God's richest blessings on you. I miss you with the, from the bottom of my heart. I miss our gathering together. I just miss our church so much. But I hope that you're staying safe. And somebody keeps asking me, when are we going to open up? Let me tell you something. We're not going to open up until, I think I may have said this here already, until everybody can come. I'm not going to open up 50% or anything like that. Uh, once we can let everybody come and everybody can be safe, that's when we're open up. So uh, we don't want anybody to take a risk or take a chance. So uh, pray that, that the power and presence of God will help them find a vaccine for this thing and some healing for it. And uh, y'all take care. And I love you with the love of Jesus. And I pray God blesses you in Jesus' name. Good night, everybody.